The name of Ron Toronac will be very familiar to people interested in historic motorsport um, and his face may be as well to many people but we don't often get a chance to speak to somebody who's had so much experience uh, in the past in motor racing um, so I'd like to ask a few questions about your career and uh, the cars you've been involved with starting off really with the Rolt cars in Australia uh, the first generation of Rolt cars which you built with your brother well, what were they like to drive and how do they compare with the competition? Well, the first car was really uh, what well, was a Formula 3 car in the UK at that time, and I'd read a few little magazines of current auto sports or whatever the equivalent was then, and heard about Formula 3. So I managed to get a, an old motorbike engine and built the car. And I think I'd read various uh, articles by Lawrence Pomeroy and things about Mercedes and auto union, so I designed a car with no knowledge other than what was in the magazine and then built the car and it was a bit of a disaster. I'd put swinging half axles on the back and uh, because I'd read that uh, interleaf friction was very good and you didn't need dampers and I had no money for it, didn't have ten pound to buy dampers so I went without them and of course first time out on a hill climb it, wheels bounced up and down and swung under and turned me over and I ended up with 14 stitches in my face. But things got better from there. <laughs> well, it took a while. Uh, I think the response was to uh, make the suspension twice as stiff as it should be so it couldn't happen again and it took a long while to, uh, to soften it off and, uh, and gradually learn out. But I, I think uh, I probably learnt more from mistakes than from doing things correctly. If you do it correctly, you don't know why the hell you've done it. Whereas you make the mistakes and you fix them up and uh, we progressed that way. And, I think the second car was a, a, a sports car for my brother with a Ford engine and I think similar to uh, the later, later sevens and so we went on from there. And this is about the sort of time you would have met Jack Brabham I suppose? Uh, yes, uh, I'd probably been running like that for about a year and he advertised an MSS 500 motorbike engine and I was always interested in uh, pulling things apart and seeing how they worked and uh, so I went up to buy it and we arrived in his, uh, where his workshop it was in his grandfather's house and uh, he saw the car that we went in which is my brother's special and he rather liked that and we got chatting and I saw his machine shop and said would he like to take in subcontract work. At first he refused because he thought it was for my cars and no one ever paid. I think it's the same now if you get people doing things for motor racing and um, I eventually said no, it was for the big company that I work for and I was subcontracting and work for them so it went on from there and we, we seemed to hit it off. And we carried on after that and um, I did some uh, design mods for his Coopers that he bought and he did some machining for me, for my uh, Norton engine etc. Obviously at that time you were driving and designing. Um, did you prefer driving or, or designing at the time? I don't know that I weighed up the two. I had no option but to design and build a car to be able to race. I think the original intention was to race but uh, the designing had to happen first. How did you rate yourself as a, as a driver? I didn't really. I mean I just uh, performed and unfortunately the races there at Mount Druitt were a handicap race and because of the car I had, I'd qualify uh, fairly well up the grid, so I had to start at the back. And the uh, other cars were often uh, fairly huge V8 engined cars, and they were much quicker down the straight, uh, so they could pass me down the straight, and I didn't have a hope in hell of passing around a corner because there's only room for one. Uh, so uh, it, it went very well. That I think the problem I had was that there's a race about once a month and I modified the car between each race to learn something about it which is how I found out what makes things work. Whereas when my brother started racing with a similar 500cc car I had told him how the handicap system worked and that um, we entered it on uh, 10 to 1 compression and but actually run it on 7 to 1 and gradually each race we'd increase the compression ratio and when we caught up we put it up the next stage and so he won a race at every meeting whereas I started off at 14 to 1 on methanol and carried on like that. 
Uh, I think my one big success was winning the uh, New South Wales Hill Climb Championship in 1954 and Jack Brabham came second in the Keeper Bristol and my brother came third in his uh, 500cc car. But again for that I'd, uh, I'd read about uh, nitromethane so I bought some which was nearly, nearly broke me, it was so expensive and put it in the car and uh, run it up the hill on nitromethane and I think um, it had seized the piston rings and they were all broken so I ended up with an oil plug and so I just put the warm-up plug in for the next run which was the successful one and the, the spark plug man was there and he said well you can't do that they said well the oil's the other one so we managed to win the championship that way. Later on uh, after Jack Brabham had come over to Europe uh, you kept in touch, well, he kept in touch with you and you I think had some design input in some of the F1 Coopers that he was racing at the time. Yes, well, we used to write air letters in those days uh, and Jack wasn't a very prolific writer and neither was I but we'd do the odd one and I'd meet him occasionally when he came out to do the Tasman series and then uh, he emailed me and I still got the letter uh, suggesting that they could lower the uh, engine by about three inches, put a pair of spur gears in to go up to the gearbox and so he suggested that I uh, design it and the bell housing and get a pattern made so I did that and uh, when he came out he uh, put the pattern under his arm from the Tasman series and took it back to England and that became the, the part of the low line. The other thing he did was to, uh, as Cooper always had transverse leaf springs on the top of the car at each end and he wanted to modernise it which was against Charlie Cooper's wishes so um, he asked me to uh, come up with some dimensions so I, I drew the relative lengths for the top wishbone and the angles they should be at and again emailed it back to him and he got it into the car by I think John Cooper knew but Charlie no and so he went to the draftsman and they just fed the thing in the back door so it became the, the draftsman's ideas and they built it and then it worked so Charlie had to go along with it. So they were the two main things that uh, I contributed. And, and then of course um, Jack Brabham invited you to come over to Europe. That was a big decision at the time and was it a hard one to make? Um, I don't know why my wife agreed because in those days you, you couldn't get transatlantic flights and things like that very easily but Jack offered to pay uh, um, my return fare to go over for six months trial and I was quite happily married with a four, month, a four year old daughter and I wasn't going to leave them behind so um, I think the reasons for coming over, the police in Australia in those days were pretty severe on the roads as they were in, in America and I had three offences for uh, speeding against me and I thought well I'll, I'll clear those by going to, to England and I thought I was going to drive when I went to England I, as well as designing and building cars I thought well that will just further the whole thing so um, I uh, had to go to America on the way to uh, attend a, a race and race engineer Jack's keep a sports car on the way uh, and so my wife and daughter were put on a boat with the goods and chattels and uh, I flew to America and then on to England and that's how it all happened. Then when you eventually arrived in England and uh, went into business with Jack Brabham you formed Motor Racing Developments or MRD which then of course became known as Brabham later on. I think there's an interesting story as to how that came about. Yes well we had appointed uh, or Jack had appointed Jabby Cromback in France as our agent and he was uh, over in France and he gave me a call and said look um, it's got a bad annotation in, in French uh, M-O-D means uh, uh, covered all over in shit uh, can we change the name and he suggested Brabham uh, that I suppose really uh, put me on the back step from then on for the rest of the career because everything became Brabham's but at the same time um, it made the thing more publicly knowledgeable and so it made the company a, a better or a, a more valuable company with that name. As Brabham in the 60s became really the, the leading manufacturer of customer single-seater cars, what things do you think 
helped that to come about? Well, it was probably a number of things. Um, firstly, uh, uh, Jack didn't anticipate me driving over there. He thought I had to work and design cars. And uh, I, I did a couple of laps around brands at one stage, and then I realised that if something happened to me, um, we had no money, and my wife was there in a strange land with a four-year-old daughter, so how was she going to get on and get back to Australia? So I suppose you can take it from that that I wasn't a racing driver, because racing drivers don't give a damn. If they're going to be a champion, they just drive whatever the risks. And so uh, I, I just built cars. So that meant that uh, uh, I didn't have any, have any driving distractions, but having driven it was useful because you knew the sort of things that a car had to have to be, uh, to be good. Um, I think the other thing was that uh, since it was going to be a joint venture, the first year I was involved in F1, uh, but at the end of the year, uh, Jack, who already had his own uh, organisation for running in the Tasman and private races, even when he was with Cooper, um, wanted to actually run his own team and, and, and me not be in, involved. So um, uh, that was agreed. So my priority was production racing cars. Uh, Formula One came distinctly second, and he often never got his his own Formula One cars because he I think he offered to pay the company, which was jointly owned, three thousand pound each for his cars without the engine, and uh, so he'd get his cars probably by the time of Monaco. In the meantime, I was building production cars, which was the whole thing that I was interested in. This changed, of course, in. Uh, at the end of um, 19, or at the beginning of 66, at the end of the one and a half litre formula, because I told Jack I didn't want to be bothered with Formula One anymore. I just built production cars and we ran our own uh, Formula Junior or Formula, the, the lower Formula teams in that year, which was again from the Motor Racing Developments or Brabham Racing Developments Company. So, um, well, what do you think was uh, better about the Brabham's than, say, the competition at the time in terms of customer cars? Um, I think every part, when, when I built a car, that car ran all year. And uh, I applied uh, engineering technique to building them. Uh, so the workshop people never had any say in after the prototype was built, in, in, in how the cars were built. Now, other manufacturers' cars were almost like one-offs each time, so you couldn't have a, a store full of parts which you could send anywhere around the world and they always fitted. But every part of every Brabham and Rolt uh, was identical and you could take them out and fit them. And I think that's because of uh, my background was in uh, um, engineering and, and designed for, for production, and so it had to be precise. In 1968, the Brabham BT26 was one of the first Formula One cars to uh, sport aerofoils. When did the idea first come to you? I think it was the previous year for Spa. I'd made a couple of little uh, nose fins or bibs, and I put them on for a lap at, at Spa and uh, Jack did the lap and come in and said that's great but it's on the wrong end of the car so we whipped them off and hid them and the following year came up with a uh, uh, an aerofoil mounted over the engine so that we could trim it backwards and forwards. I think the following day uh, Ferrari appeared with one mounted in an identical position but obviously they had it already made and uh, just pulled it out a day later than us. And of course that was the start really of uh the, the current emphasis on aerodynamics and, and downforce. And of course, quite soon after the small aerofoils appeared over the engine, things escalated. Yes, well, I think, think the following race meeting was Ruan. And uh, Chapman, once he sees an idea, develops it to the extreme, uh, often with unfortunate circumstances. So he. Uh, came up at Rouen with a, a huge aerofoil mounted on the rear uprights and uh, that wasn't entirely successful at Rouen but uh, we carried on from there and all had bigger upright, bigger wings etc. And then uh, at uh, a meeting in Montjuic Park in Barcelona um, there were two accidents. 
with the lattices uh, where the airfoil came off and leapt over the fence and also in uh, one of the Brabham's the uh, leading edge split and the airfoil collapsed in the middle. I think it was on uh, Jackie Hicks's car. So uh, uh, the following race meeting was at um, Monaco and uh, that led to a ban after the first practice of airfoils. Uh, after the ban, I think the next race was Zandvoort, and um, well, you weren't allowed to have aerofoils, you could have whatever body shape you liked. So I uh, made an engine cover with a, a duck tail on the back, which would uh, create the downforce that would potentially give us what we needed. And uh, at Zandvoort, I think there was a early practice, artificial practice sessions on the Wednesday, and me being a fool, uh, produced this engine cover and we run it and Chapman saw it and uh, got his, some of his team members together and headed back home and uh, appeared a couple of days later in time for the race with uh, a replica and uh, it, things went on from there. Around that time you had uh, two of the drivers who were perceived as being the future of motor racing, up and coming drivers, uh, Jochen Rint and Jackie Ickes. How do they compare? Well, um, Rint I got along very well with, uh, contrary to uh, people's opinions, they think he was a little bit arrogant, but I found that uh, if you talk sense to him, he, he always answered well. And in fact, uh, we shared a room, or well, because in those days there was not a lot of money in racing, and so everyone had to have dual occupancy, and they said they had a money of their own, so Rint and I shared and went on very well. Um, he wasn't particularly technical, uh, although I think he was learning. Uh, the following year we had X and uh, the, the, the things had changed by then. We had switched from the uh, Repco engine, which was a disaster in uh, 68, and had a Cosworth Rix in 69. And uh, I think there's a difference. He never ever showed up at the workshop. He had arrived just in time for first practice and leave immediately after the race. Uh, it didn't really mix in with the people and he didn't show any form until uh, Jack had an accident at Silverstone when he was tyre testing and a tyre blew up. I think they were testing two ply tyres and it failed and he had an accident and uh, broke his ankle so he couldn't drive for a few races. And that's when Nix's driving talent came to light. I think he needed things centred around him and uh, it showed up, but again, a little later in the season uh, at Monza, um, he got an offer to go back to Ferrari, which he couldn't refuse, and so off he went. Brint almost came back to Brabham's in 1970. Do you think if he had gone to Brabham and not stayed with Lotus that he might have been world champion in 1970 in a BT33? It, it's possible, but probably no more likely than Jack being world champion, because Jack would have won that year except for three circuit incidents at Brands. He actually passed Rent, in the, and Rent was in his latest, and ran out of petrol with one corner to go, and so he came in second. And that was down to um, one of our mechanics leaving the uh, Lucas fuel injection on Rich, which you have to start up instead of turning it down to that. And the mechanic. We, know, we didn't know who it was until about two years ago and he finally owned up to it. So that was one race where he came second instead of first mm. and it could have been either. Um, the ne another one was Monaco and uh, Jack had a huge lead but he got held up going up the hill uh, behind um, Siffert who was swishing the car from side to side to try and pick up the last drop of petrol. I think Jack lost eight or ten seconds just on one lap and he would have still won but he thought it was closer than he was. I was giving him signals, but the signals you gave behind the pit in those days at Monaco and um, so Jack tried to do the last bit of the last lap very quickly. He took the inside line because there wasn't room down the outside of a, a slower car and ended up on the pebbles or marbles, I think they're called, when, uh, when he was braking and just slightly overshot. He went into the sandbags at the corner, still could have backed out and won one, uh, 
but one of the marshals tried to want to push him and Jack wouldn't move the car backwards until he got the marshal out of the way, otherwise he would have been disqualified. And he lost several seconds doing that and he backed it out and Rid had gone by and he came second. After uh, Jack Brabham retired at the end of 1970, um, you ran Brabham for a while and then eventually sold to Bernie Eccleston, uh, who's obviously gone on to much greater things since then. Um, you didn't stay on after that. Why, why was that? Well, it's a matter of where I start the story. I don't think the top mechanic, which is Ron Dennis and Neil Trundle, uh, believed that Jack was going to retire, so they stayed on. And uh, then right at the end, it was almost Christmas, they really found out he definitely was retiring, so they then left to start their own business with Ron Dell. Um, so the following year, I had to find another chief mechanic very quickly and I got a recommendation from Jacques from one head that he'd worked for and, but it turned out to be a disaster. So that wasn't a very happy year for me so that set the seeds for me to, to sell out. Uh, also uh, you needed to be fairly expert at, at going around and getting sponsorship and I wasn't really interested in doing those things. I didn't want to wine and dine people. I didn't have the expertise in that area. So it meant taking on someone else. So Rint introduced me to Bernie, who then um, uh, wanted to buy or buy half the thing. I said, no, I don't want another partnership experience. So it's all or nothing. So he agreed to buy me out. And that went uh, not well in my favour, but uh, at least we did the job. And uh, then uh, uh, come... Christmas time I always took a fortnight off work to go skiing with my family and I missed about actually four days of work so nothing much could go wrong in those four days but uh, Bernie had done some negotiation with Colin Seeley to take up his motorbike business to combine the whole lot and when I came back from my holiday they were really my drawing board space was gone and the business was being run without me so I, I did stay on and um, Eventually, uh, the accountants who normally gave me a check out of my company funds or told me to write a check for so much uh, each month, they were told not to give me a check anymore. The rest of the accounting and checks were done within the, the business. And uh, so anyway, they said, but you can write your own, which I did. So it did things didn't look as though I was really wanted around. and. Uh, Gradually, I was sort of squeezed out. During your time at Brabham, you were responsible for something like 600 cars, and then at Rolt afterwards, over a thousand. In that long list of cars, which are the ones that you got particular affection for, or which ones are you proud of? Yeah, proud of it. I'm not. I don't have affection for anything. Um, I would think in the Brabham days, the 24, uh, it was really the first car uh, of the new era of, uh, that I'd actually designed specifically for it. Although we won the championship of the 19 the year before, it was really a, uh, a car made for the one and a half litre Climax 16 cylinder which didn't ever come out. Uh, so we did a quick conversion job to, to run that and then the, the 24 came out and uh, I think again it had uh, uh, specific designed front uprights and suspension compared to the uh, uh, Triumph Herald ones that we'd used up to that date and uh, it was well, fairly tidy uh, as a car goes. Uh, then if we move on to the next era which was Rolt, um, I think the, the first one I did was the RT1 and it was the most versatile of all the cars because it uh, it ran in four formula as the same basic car with just different size fuel cells. It was in uh, Formula 3, uh, Atlantic, Super V, Formula 2 uh, with these different cells So that, and that went on for a few years being successful until the although there were developments each year, it was basically the same car until we ended up in the uh, start of ground effects in 1989, uh, no, 1979, 1980, and then it had to change. And I suppose uh, once we get into that era, um, the, in 
performance three, the 35 was very good because although it was a, just an aluminium, some monocoque reinforcing, it uh, was still a winner the following couple of years against cars which were uh, um, carbon fibre monocoques and so forth and it was still quite successful. Um, I think following that when I went into carbon fibre, um, the um, RT40 Atlantic car Again, in its first year, it uh, it swept the field in in America, and uh, that and its successor, which was just a development, the 41, went on and on, winning until they wanted an American car to win, and they uh, penalised with weight older cars, and that's how they could get swift up front, and that's it, it wasn't worth designing a new car for the small sales there each year. How did you fill in your time between the period of Brabham and then restarting Ralt? I did a little bit of consulting work, um, probably starting with Frank Williams. Uh, I did, uh, I think he got me to uh, race engineer the march that he'd been running uh, down at Vallelonga and uh, then I was also asked to go out to South Africa and look after one of the cars out there. That was quite an experience. I arrived there and there had been a practice day and um, the quill shaft from, or the input shaft from the gearbox had seized in the back of the, uh, uh, the flywheel of the engine and uh, they had uh, the truck and another thing one toe on, tied onto each end, so I was about to try and pull it apart when I arrived and said, hold it, hold it, you know, you've got to take the gearbox to pieces and <laughs> get the input shaft out. So that was the first experience with, with Frank. And uh, then on a couple of other occasions, he had uh, other people designing and building a car and they'd get it about 90% finished, it was all laid out and part built. and. Uh, then they never finished the job. I don't know why, whether it was a financial problem or um, they built themselves into a corner. So one was the poly toys, which I finished off, and the other one was the uh, Issa Marlborough. And so that built up a good relationship with Frank, uh, and he actually paid me. I had no problems for doing that. Uh, the other uh, project was for Trojan, who were, had been agents for McLaren and were building their uh, former, former 5000 car under some license and um, they wanted some work done on that. I think they were severing their relationship with uh, McLaren so I went there and uh, modified a car for the 5000 uh, or designed one and uh, then they wanted to race it and I suggested that for the same price they could race a Formula 1 car as a 5000 so they agreed to do that and uh, then uh, I needed help in the drawing office so I uh, uh, somehow bumped into Patrick Head who had done a one-off car for someone and uh, uh, I employed him and the two of us got to work and did the Trojan. Uh, we hit it off quite well and uh, um, he was more mathematically trained than I was since he'd had a diploma and I had no education virtually and uh, it worked out very well. Currently the historic motor racing scenes uh, enjoying huge popularity and of course some of the cars racing are ones that you were responsible for many years ago. What are your views on historic racing these days? Well, thinking of the cars that I did, when we made them they weren't particularly safe and a few years on uh, with uh, other things have happened to increase their performance they're, they're, they're still not safe and I think some of the rule makers and some of the drivers are obsessed with leaving the cars in the condition they were. Now I'm not in favour of that. Uh, I think uh, okay, that they put taller roll bars on because that's obvious and they put seat belts in but if you look at the detail of how it's done these things are just uh, whirling onto the sides of tubes etc and they don't convey the load fully over into the car. Uh, the other thing that I think um, needs to be done is the footbox area. Um, if you look at a, a modern car, it's completely enclosed and if you do have an accident, your feet go, don't get tangled up in tubes or on steering column and that. 
And so it, it should be permitted to, or essential, to line that f foot box area with, uh, it can be lightweight honeycomb or plastic sheet or anything to stop you getting tangled up in the car. And if people want it to look original, they only need to go on with some tie wraps, you can take it out and, uh, and make it original again. Uh, so I think a fair bit needs to be done towards the safety thing. I think um, some impact box on the nose could be hidden inside the nose box. Uh, and s the sort of regulations in current cars need to be to be looked at and allowed in these historic things. Uh, the, the problem is that a lot of the people that drive it are, uh, have, have made it in life and become fairly wealthy business people and they're living out their, their childhood dreams which they never had time or money to do perhaps in the early days uh, and they think they're not driving at ten tenths but it only takes a blowout or an, another tr driver to lose it and knock you off the track and uh, you, you, you suffer the consequences so that uh, I'm not a real fan of historic racing but I do go to meetings that I'm invited to and unfortunately I tend to lecture these people on what they should do to their cars. So <laughs> I don't know how long I'll be popular then. So have you totally retired now or are you still involved in any way with current racing? Well I, I do two or three things. Um, I've been involved with the former V8 supercars in Australia for the last couple of years and they're quite a challenge. Uh, they do not have a differential and they've got a beam rear axle and they're fairly tightly controlled with regulations, so you can't change a lot. So that was quite a challenge to be able to uh, uh, do some improvements to those cars each year. Uh, there's something um, in the wings for me to in be involved with one of those series this coming year, but until I get back to Australia I won't know what it is. But um, I couldn't retire, I have to do something. and. Uh, so uh, I also uh, am a senior design judge for former student SAE for the last uh, three years down in Melbourne and there's cars from the unis from all over the world and so uh, it's interesting to put something back and try and help these, these young coming people. It's quite a good series um, and if there's nothing else going then I, I live in an apartment block which has got a gym and a pool attached so I spend an hour and a half down there every morning.